a job is go into the booth and work it as if it already is a booking. Give everything to it. Pay attention to it. Bring the truth to it. Mm -hmm. Be organic with it. The reason I, I just accept and love coaching people is because it's coaching you to love yourself and find the most creative space within you to succeed. But there were so many issues that I brought with me from New York. I didn't just bring my luggage when I moved. I also brought my baggage. Things that were uh, not settled within me. And when they're not settled within you, you're also bringing your fear. I asked God to help heal me. I just wanted to be happy. Before we jump into the episode, I cannot forget the comment of the day. This comes from Laura Kay, who commented on the episode of Sam Lake interview that I did not so long ago. She quotes by saying, you have to fiercely believe in what you make. This was such a great interview. There will be never a day that passes that I'm not inspired by Sam Lake and the love and excitement he holds for his work and the rest of the Remedy team. Seeing his passion is contagious and makes me so excited for what's to come. I absolutely love the interview and just being able to listen to you and Sam talk about all things Remedy and Alan Wake. Absolutely wonderful interview. Thank you so much for sharing with us, Abhi. Thank you so much for the comments. I really appreciate you saying all those kind words. It's so inspiring, as you said, to listen to Sam Lake talk about all those things. He did mention about you have to fiercely believe in what you make, which I really, really agree on, that you have to fiercely believe in what you make so that things can come true. Uh, the dreams that you want to achieve comes true. And now here is Deborah Wilson, who played Amanda Waller in Suicide Squad, Kill the Justice League, Seer Junda in Star Wars Jedi Survivor, and many more characters. Hey, what is up, everybody? Welcome back once again to Behind the Voice. I'm joined by Deborah Wilson. She's a returning guest, and it's amazing to see you once again. Thank you so much for taking the time again to join the show. It is my pleasure. It is my blessing. It is my honor. Thank you for having me back. Yes, it was, it was amazing last year that I got to talk to you. And it's amazing to know that you have been nominated for performer in a supporting role at the BAFTAs, which is incredible. So congratulations to you for being nominated. Thank you. Thank you. It is an honor. It is um, a bit of a shock <laughs> and definitely an honor. Uh, when I first had heard about it, someone had texted me and said, you've been nominated and for a BAFTA. And I was like, I don't think so. And <laughs> and I, I'm not on social media, mm. so I wasn't sure. And then I did the, the research and I wasn't nominated at the time. It was a list of, of potential nominees. Mm -hmm. So there were like 20 or 30 people that were were looked at for a nomination, but were not nominated at the time. It was like, these are the people that are being considered like consideration for mm -hmm. nominations. Wow. And I looked at all that and I was like, no, I'm considered for nomination, but there's so many games, so many prolific games and so many prolific performances in those games. Yeah. I'm just among a group of people that are looked at as a nominee. And I went, oh, that's what it is. That's really great. And I was looking at all the list of people and I was like, this is a phenomenal list of people. Yeah. And for me, that was the fun and that was the joy in seeing the list of all these amazing people. Um, Cause I am a, I'm not a gamer, but I'm a game fan. Awesome. Yeah. Based on performances. And so I was just honored to be among all of these really cool people, including of course, Cameron Monaghan yeah. as Cal Estes for Star Wars Jedi Survivor. And then later on, someone came back to me and said, congratulations on your nomination. Um, and I was like, again, <laughs> it's not a nomination. I'm in a group. They're like, no, you were nominated. I was like, no, it's a group of people. They're like, no, you were nominated. And then they sent me the actual nominee. And then people had been coming to me on social, on, not on social media, but on again, on text messages. Congratulations on the nomination. I was like, okay, I guess I was. And then the director of a Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order and Star Wars Jedi Survivor, Tom Keegan, came to congratulate me. And I was like, okay, there's the seal of approval that this is yeah. this is reality. And wow. it was a really, really lovely. It's a really lovely thing. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> Love that. That's so cool. And, and I really believe that you deserve this nomination. You've played the roles in both the games so very well. Uh, one of them, like, I think I think it's very hard to remember characters, especially in, in games which are where characters are not really fleshed out. Your character was so fleshed out. Your performance is so memorable that it's easily one of the highlights in, in the Star Wars game. So thank you really for doing everything you did for Seer. A absolutely. Thank you. This this role, this being, this this amazing person. Yeah. Um, 
I had such a deep, profound connection and a deep, profound symbiosis with. Mm. Um, very painful at times, reality-wise. Yeah. Um, and always beautiful. But this one changed me forever. This oh. role changed me forever. Um, my relationship with Cameron Monaghan uh, was was powerful. And I'm not talking about Cal Kestis. I'm talking about Cameron Monaghan. Mm -hmm. This experience forever changed me. And my relationship with Cameron Monaghan, we don't see each other. We don't work together. But we're still in the force together with such a deep, profound respect and love that is undying and unshakable. Uh, and so the experience that I had um, having this experience with Cameron Monaghan and Sear having this res res relationship with Cal Kestis, mm -hmm. everything was symbiotic. Not just me and what I'm doing and not just Cameron with what he's doing, yeah. but all four of us, four of us had the symbiotic relationship. And I think that's what made it so overwhelmingly emotional and powerful. Yeah, yeah it's gives me shivers to this day. It makes me cry to this day. It makes me think of the game and every experience that was tangibly emotional on those levels. And I can't think of Seer without thinking about how much I love Cameron. Yeah. I can't think of Deborah without how much I love Seer. <laughs> I can't think of Seer without thinking of how much she loves Cal. And um, there were so many things that were personal and intimate and unspoken that came through the performance instead of just the words. Wow. That's, that's so lovely to hear. And you're right. Yeah. It, it spoke uh, unspokable words uh, when, when, when we played the game and we get, get to see the scenes, but uh, is there something that you took from Seer or maybe something that you both Deborah and Seer shared? Was there something that was there when you played this character? Everything. Wow everything that's what made it symbiotic her grief and regret her desire for forgiveness her feeling unworthy mm. to use the force because she wielded it in a dangerous way yeah and a fatal way i am familiar in my life with all of it and that's what made it really powerful going back to tap into that space and work in the volume to record it was a confession to the world and confession to everyone in that room of the things that I had done. Mm -hmm. Without saying it, I let Sears tell people what I had done. Yeah. And for me, it wasn't Sear telling everyone. Yes, for everyone else it was. Mm -hmm. But for Deborah, it was, I'm telling you what I've done in my past without giving you details. I'll let Sear explain it through her journey, but she's telling you the things that I regret, the things I would not forgive, the choices that I made that were harmful. And I'm telling you. And so it was a confession every time I worked. And there was a beauty still in the simplicity of things, in the relationships, you know, um, that allowed me that respite and yeah. that joy moment. But Sears driving space is still the driving space I have in my life to raise the conscious vibration, the creative vibration, the love vibration, the awareness of um, possibility and potential and choice. I'm still on that journey and Sear is with me every day. Wow. That's lovely to hear. That's lovely. Um, and and, and I, I always remember that game. It's probably one of my favorite games. It was so cool to play that game. And it's it's one of those games. It's again been a fan of Star Wars a little late, but I I still became a fan of Star it's Wars. It's always on time. It's always on time. Yes, and I loved I loved watching when you everything. when you love that and when you immerse yourself in that. It's always on time for you to discover <laughs> when you're ready. Oh yes, ah, I love that. That was that. That's a great way to put that. Um, but it's it's really cool because again I, I mentioned you before like how I posted how you're going to be my guest on social media and a lot of people are uh, uh, know you from Matt TV. So if you take all the way back um, at the time when you joined Matt TV, you were the uh, first African-American woman to be in that show. What, and you, you played a part for so long. How has, it, how has that been for you over 
these years and also how like how did that help your career at the same time i don't know i, I won't say that things i i look at things in larger concepts in a larger perspective mm -hmm. i don't know if it helped my career but i know it was a step up in terms of where i'm climbing to mm -hmm. and yet when i look up i have no idea where i'm meant to go with some people who climb a rock wall they have those spaces, those gaps, those holes to go, and they know where they're going to go. Mm -hmm. And they're configuring what foot would go where. But in this craft and in, in this industry, I don't know where I'm supposed to get to because it's not like a rock world wall where you can tell your foot goes here or there mm -hmm. yeah. because It's always shifting based on the industry. It's always shifting based on the people. It's always shifting based on um, auditions. It's always shifting based on producers and casting and if you're right for something or if you're not right for something. So it's constantly shifting. Mm -hmm. And for me, it there was a, a respite in the moment because after Mad TV, I didn't work a lot. Mm -hmm. But that respite was to grow myself and better know myself for whatever was meant to come. Yeah. So it felt like a stop gap for me to go, all right, stop climbing and start thinking, start breathing and stop looking because the looking to get where I'm meant to go will reek of desperation and fear. And so I had to stop for that moment and let everything go. And in letting everything go like a rock wall, I let myself fall. I let myself fall. And trusted that I was going to land. I had no choice but to land. Mm -hmm. I didn't know where I was going to land. I didn't know how it would feel. But I had to let myself go and 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 um, allow myself to hit the bottom of from where I, I started from to build myself, to heal myself, to grow myself, to recognize my wounds from mm -hmm. the inside out and get stronger from that. So this way, when I'm climbing... My mentality is different mm -hmm. than when I first started climbing after Mad TV. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a wonderful thing, and that's actually at the same time very hard to do because you don't want to kind it's of. Supposed yeah, I mean, yeah, it's true. I mean, it, it, at some points, like even for for someone like even for me, especially personally, I guess it's very hard to like. Oh, we have to go. Probably have to fall back again to do something better. And to just take that judgment or just just take that step of falling back even, sometimes it's very hard for a lot of people. But I think if they realize and understand that it's a long uh, a game, it's a long process. Uh, and, and then I think hopefully some people will be able to take that step and realize that it's okay to, to actually take a step back, few steps back, and then sort of start again, but in a better mindset. So now you can achieve something even more than Can you even imagine? Absolutely. I always tell people this in general. People say, and I get the same thing that you get where people say, like, yeah, I know, but it's so hard. And I go, yes, it is hard, yeah. but it's not impossible. Because if you separate the I am from the possible mm -hmm. and put an apostrophe between the first two letters, impossible becomes I'm possible. Yeah, that's that's really true. And that's that's wonderful to put at. But You know, it's it's so cool. And, and and you just mentioned how you had to take a step back and kind of restart everything. So if you take how who was Deborah Wilson at the time when you were in Mad TV and who's Deborah Wilson currently right now? Deborah Wilson during the Mad TV time, I, I got a lot of attention for the show. I was the only black woman at the time. I was starting to do things like, you know, the Oprah Winfrey impression um, and or the impersonation or the impression and the the Bunifa Lutifa Halifa Sharifa Jackson character. And so yeah. plus I sang and I did this and that. And so uh, I was getting, gaining attention for that. And it was steamrolling. But there were so many issues that I brought with me from New York. Mm -hmm. I didn't just bring my luggage when I moved. I also brought my baggage, things that were uh, not settled within me. And when they're not settled within you, you're also bringing your your fear, yeah, your unworthiness. Mm -hmm. um, I brought a lot of my um, unworthiness 
uh, and my fear and my desperation to hold on to because I thought I was unworthy. So this was Mad TV was this great mask that I can wear of a show because I can disappear in improv. I can disappear in music. I can disappear in characters. Yeah. But I was constantly shrinking myself in order to be big as all the things that I did, which is why I could push the envelope and why, you know, I I, I went boom with Mad TV because it's the perfect show to do that with. But it was also the perfect vehicle to diminish myself. And in the process of being uh, that big person, um, I met someone, I fell in love, I got married. And so now it's like, OK, now I got to make sure I'm a great wife because yeah. I have to I'm, I'm not feeling worthy of this amazing human being. Now I have to make sure I'm a great wife. So now I have all these titles. Be a great comedian. Be a great actor. Mm-hmm. Be a great singer for the show. Be funny. Do be great at improv. Yeah. Now be a great wife. Be a great wife. And I bought a home. Be a great homeowner. What a huge place. I wasn't married at the time. And I had met my husband at the time, um, who's now my ex-husband and best friend. Um, and so I bought this huge place. Now I have to fill it up. I'm a homeowner. I bought a house. I have a house. I have a home. I have a town home. I have a town home. Look at me. I bought, you know, I bought property. And so all of these things that preceded me uh, while I could shrink was homeowner, wife, actress, comedian, TV personality. But when Mad TV, after Mad TV, I wasn't working a lot. When all those things disappear, the only equation in that is that I am a failure. So the desperation came full up, like vomiting just came up. Mm. Yeah. Um, my marriage was crumbling. I wasn't working. My career was dead or dying. I couldn't afford my home. I was losing that. And so that's when it was, I have to let go because I can't hold this stuff. I can't run on this wheel to catch up to an industry that no longer wants me while running on this wheel to avoid my bills and losing my home. Mm -hmm. And I had to let go. I had to let go. And in letting go, I could deal with the wounds. I can address them for what they are. And I can with my belief in, and faith in God, allow that healing to take place and then make different choices. That's what it really came down to. I, I asked God to help heal me. I said, I just want, and I asked for nothing. I didn't ask for my husband back. I didn't ask for a home. I didn't ask for any of that stuff. I just wanted to be happy. Yeah. I just wanted to find peace. And God answered me completely. I just, I just wanted to be happy. And, um, and then all of a sudden, instantly, I felt the healing. I mean, instantly. I stopped eating. I stopped drinking. I stopped going out because I knew that I would face people and I would look at them and they would ask me what's going on and I would feel the failure in me. So I stopped. So I stopped eating because I didn't buy groceries. I stopped drinking. I just, I, it, it was all of that. Literally. It was because I just went, no, because if you go out, people are going to stop you. And then you're going to have to tell them that you're a failure. You're going to say, oh, nothing much was going on. And you'll have to, and, and for your mind, it's like, that's because you're a failure. Mm. Oh, I'm, well, I'm not really working that much right there these days. That's because you're a failure. And yeah. so when I, when I, when I, I finally let go and stopped being afraid that's when the happiness came and I asked God literally on my knees, I just want to be happy. You tell me what you want me to do. And instantly I felt healed because I was confessing. I let it all go. I let it all go. No one likes to vomit, but you feel better after. Yes. So I got rid of all of that and I felt healed. And I had a conversation with my husband I had a conversation with the bank and um, I went, none of this matters to me because I never really got to know you, meaning my husband, in a way that was fair and clear because I always made you an object of my affection that I didn't want to lose because losing you would make me mad. But um, as a wife, I am a failure. And I held on to you like I held on to an object and I don't want to treat you that way. 
I'm, I lost me. I became defined by these ideas, but not as Deborah. And so I need to find me again. And I can't find me in this marriage because I changed everything over within a week to two weeks. My name, my social security, my be- everything. My name was changed. Everything had been changed over so I can be a wife, a wife. And if I had his last name, I'd be a wife. Mm-hmm. And so I, I, I told him this, I, I can't do this. I said, I, I can do us in, in the way that is going to be healthy and whatever that looks like. But that means you have to choose. And that means I have to choose. But that means we have to choose separately as individuals. Yeah. So I chose for myself as an individual to get divorced because I wanted to take a step back. And so he took a step back and, 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 and the divorce was finalized. And um, we remained friendly throughout and we just continued to get closer. And I said, see, this is what the relationship was meant to be. This love, this power, because it's honest, it's refreshing, it's truth, it's transparent, yeah. it's real. And he and I, to this day, are best friends. We live no more than five minutes away from each other. We have brunch every Sunday. Wow. We are close. We talk to each other every day. We laugh or joke or send stupid stuff in a text message every day. Um, and we that's the closeness. See, that's what a marriage is. Mm -hmm. We don't have a piece of paper. We're not in love. We're not intimate. We're not having sex. We are just the type of friends that are eternal and forever. And I realize I can have that with everyone in my life that I love because I'm married to, devoted to, and committed to loving the people in my life and sharing those experiences. And sharing their experiences and listening and being in their lives and experiences. That's what marriage is to me. And so I will never, I really believe, and this is just a belief for me, mm-hmm. be in another intimate relationship again. I will not get married again. I will not have a boyfriend again. I will not have a life partner in this lifetime because what I'm carrying now is greatly more profound than being married to one person. I'm not having sex anymore. I am celibate. I've been celibate now for uh, almost 15 years. Wow. Um, and I, I don't miss that. Mm-hmm. What I did miss was having relationships that mattered. And now that I have that, there's nothing to miss. Yeah. Having relationships and building relationships that mattered with people, being of service in the lives of others, being of service to those in need, being of service to the homeless, being of ser- all of those things fulfill me. So I have no need to look back on anything else because there's nothing empty in me. And so that's the difference between the mad TV, Deborah Wilson, and who this person is now who's able to go, I so align with Sir Junda to the point in which I can tell my story through her and be nominated for a BAFTA. That's the Deborah Wilson you get now. Yes. Open, caring, loving, accessible. Come into my life and let me hear about yours. That's the human being that I am. That's the spirit being I am. That's the day I ask God to make me happy and support that happiness. That's the day I choose from this day forward until the day I die. Wow. That is so amazing. I'm so happy that, that, you know, regardless of what happened, I'm so happy how it all turned out, how you decided to do what it was, what you needed at that time, what you needed to have. And now you are, you are a person that, that, you know, it's so amazing because I don't think so anyone who has, who knows you, who has seen your work, I don't, I feel like everybody has watched you in, in interviews and podcasts and they know that you are such a, a wonderful person to, to just listen to. You're so wise and you're so kind and so kind hearted. And it just, it just shows that, that you are now a person that, that just wants to connect with others and just share that love and share that passion. And it just, you know, your passion just flows through me and just it makes me passionate about everything that I do. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Yes. And, and it's so, it's so crazy because when I see the amount of work that you've done, you've done so much, you've done so many movies, TVs, games, and it's, it's incredible to see how you continue to do 
And it almost feels like I, I, I don't know how you do it. So how is it like, how are you able to balance all of these projects? Because there's a lot that you continue to do. Is that, is that something that you like where, you know, I, I know some people who like to always continuously work, which I also do where I have to work on something in that mindset. Is that something that you do or you just love, love acting just that much? It happens and I just go, yes. <laughs> I'm saying yes to the infinite process. So it happens. I audition and I and, it, and if I book something, yes. And then scheduling my beautiful agency, CESD Talent Agency in Los Angeles. I cannot thank everyone enough. They are more than my agency. They are my family wow. for life. And uh, they love me. They appreciate me. They get me. I love them. I appreciate them. And I get them there. It's a very personal relationship. It's a very personal relationship. And so they're always, they know me well enough from the inside out mm. to submit me for things. And a lot of times I book those things because they know me well enough to know Deborah's got a shot at this. Yeah. Deborah's really got a shot at this. And so now they can pitch me for things and saying, you might know her already, but if you don't, here are some of her samples. And then they'll be like, okay, well, let's put her in an audition. Mm. They don't, I don't, I don't just automatically get it. And sometimes I do when it comes to animation. Um, I had uh, uh, quite a bit to get to uh, doing Disney stuff. I do a lot of Disney work also. Yeah. I am the sixth Daisy Duck in Disney history and the first woman of color to voice her. Wow, that's so cool. That's amazing. For, uh, and it's so different because you have Seer Jundo on one hand mm -hmm. and then you have Daisy on another. Can you believe it? Of course. <laughs> you know that? <laughs> that is so amazing. That's wonderful. I love that. Yeah, you've played so many amazing characters with is the animation in TV and the games? It's insane to see how much, and it comes through. Like every single character, it just it just comes through, and is able to connect with the player who's playing that, or whether is whoever is watching uh, the show or the the movie, whatever it is. It just just goes through through the screen to the to the person who's seeing it. It's so it's so incredible, it's so amazing. But as you said, like you just you have all these auditions and everything that that you keep on getting. I, I'm curious, what, what's a day in a life in, in, in Deborah Wilson? Like, what's a day look like for you? The night before, I'll do some auditions that are due the next day. And if I'm working that next day, then I will stay up to make sure those auditions are done because I can't get to them while I'm out working. Mm -hmm. I'll walk my dog. I'll feed my dog. I'll make a smoothie. I'll go out and do my audition. Uh, I'll go out and do uh, uh, my my. Uh, my sessions sometimes i'll work from the home booth and then when i come back in i'm doing paperwork signing stuff online uh, and and going through schedules and sometimes there are last minute auditions and things like that and i'll try to get those done um i'll go grocery shopping and try to make a meal for myself and then throw the dishes in the just sink and leave them there and try to watch a little something to unwind and then fall asleep in my clothes on the floor then I'll wake up at 4 a.m. or 5 a.m. going, oh, I still have to do this. And then I'm wide awake to get those things done. And like, oh, yeah, yeah but now it's you're running out of time because I take so I take my time with auditions because um, there's a difference between a job and a booking. Mm. People think they're the same. But for me, they're not. A job is go into the booth and work it as if it already is a booking. Give everything to it. Pay attention to it. Bring the truth to it. Mm -hmm. Be organic with it. Do your research with it. And I'll do all those things. So it does take me time to get through an audition. I just don't record it and leave. I give it thought. I give it as much thought as the people who gave this project thought. And so I will, I'll go and I will do those things. And as I do those things, I go, oh, it's got to take a shower. Get out of here. <laughs> or, oh, crap. I don't have time for a shower. Just wipe your private parts. Clean the private parts. Get down there. Get down there. Okay. <laughs> Press the teeth. Get, get, watch it. Okay. Get out. And do these things. And I'm like this. So now I've been up since four or five. And now it's five o'clock in the evening. So that's 12 hours. And I come back. And the first thing I'm thinking of, I have to walk my dog. I have to mm. feed my dog. I have to take care of my, I have uh, loads of animals here. I have critters everywhere. <laughs> there is an, an enclosure in, in, on every table here in my living area. And there wow. are, 14 enclosures in my bedroom. Damn. I have 14 tarantulas, seven <laughs> lizards, two snakes, a dog, and a scorpion. 
<laughs> my god that's crazy so i um, you know it's like making sure i take care of them mm. everybody got water clean up the poop so i'm always uh, everything is like this and my home life is my work life because i have a booth here and i record nickelodeon shows i record two nickelodeon shows monster high and baby sharks big show from from the bedroom uh um. in my booth so it's it's a work environment that's a home environment and in between i try to watch a movie and relax and then i fall asleep because i just can't get through it <laughs> I've seen Aquaman, The Lost Kingdom six times and <laughs> still I've missed major parts of it. Because I was like, oh, let's watch. I I've seen the original Aquaman. Let's go see this one. <laughs> and when I get tired, a lot of people have a bed ritual. A bed ritual is, oh, I'm getting tired. I'm going to take a shower. Oh, I'm getting tired. Mm -hmm. Let me wash my face, brush my teeth. Let me put on my pajamas. Let me lay in bed. Let me just do stuff on the internet while I'm in bed. Not me. My ritual is, there's the floor. <laughs> Lit clothes and everything. So I had not been to bed yesterday until 7. <laughs> so 7 p.m. Mm. So you're talking up, you know, for 18 hours. So I didn't eat yesterday because by the time I got in, I had enough time to walk and feed my dog. And I didn't walk her. I'm going to walk her after this. But feed her. And then I said, okay, I'm going to do my prayers. I always do my prayers. I was doing my evening prayers, and then as soon as I finished, I fell asleep. <laughs> so I woke up going, all right, let me lie down on the bed. I lay down on the bed with this on. It was what I wore yesterday. So I stink. You're, you're, the people who are watching this, you can't smell me for good reason. <laughs> fell asleep, got up going, oh, wait, I forgot to answer these emails from my agency. Let me answer these emails. Someone else emailed me. Let me answer this email. Oh, the dog. Okay. Well, let me feed her. No, I don't have time to walk her. I'll walk her after. Okay. Wash your face and brush your teeth and just put on some makeup. Just wash your face, brush your put on some makeup. Okay. Oh, I got five minutes. Make a smoothie. At least make a smoothie and take your supplements. Do that at least. And then you'll walk Lucy after. You know you'll walk Lucy after. Okay. Do that much. Here we go. Oh, and here I am. That's, that's me. That's me. <laughs> wow. And then on Sunday... Where you like, oh, well, if it, it is a Sunday and you're not working, what do you do? Critter, critters. <laughs> I have, like I said, I have three animals that eat live mice. Mm -hmm. So it's getting them food, um, getting everybody else crickets, uh, a, a dog, uh, tarantula. I have 14 of them. And then my scorpion, who is absolutely amazing and beautiful. <laughs> wow. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. Are you able to do all of it? It's incredible. And then, and then working on my my home projects, uh, as in um, I'm have building. I'm it, it's I'm putting together the interior of uh, a new enclosure for my my Mexican king snake, and I want to do the whole interior so it looks like Mexico, so it oh. looks like the desert, the rocky hills of Mexico. So I'm working on that. And someone built this amazing interior. His name is Trevor, a friend of mine, built this amazing interior for my tegu lizard, my Colombian tegu lizard. And it's, I'm just going to show your audience. I'm going to show you my oh. audience. Wow. That is amazing. So that is the interior. That is beautiful. Wow. Of my enclosure. It's six feet by two feet by two feet. Wonderful. This one holds some lizards oh wow and this one holds toads i forgot that i have four toads sorry to include <laughs> them oh, wow these are so wonderful and this over here holds it's a deluxe for two also lizards but they get about 15 inches each wow. wonderful love these Wow. And in the bedroom, I have tarantulas here. I love these uh, uh, in environments. enclosures. Yeah. And I have king snake in here, although this is too small for my king snake. It's just temporary. Okay. Oh. Wow. And more enclosures down here. <laughs> and those hold tarantulas. Wow. There's a shelving you for more tarantulas. And over here for more tarantulas. <laughs> and down here 
This is my, I have to show you this. This is really special. Dirty laundry. <laughs> that is dirty laundry. So that is, those are my babies and I'm very prideful of them. I just love them so much. That's so <laughs> it's taking care of those, cleaning out their enclosures and then setting up, and I'm setting up all new enclosures. So that's going to be a task in and of itself. So all of those enclosures that you saw, mm. I'm getting rid of them all. I'm getting simple and light enclosures for them. And I'm setting all 14 of them up wow. soon. And then I'm going to build out my own enclosure for the snake, which will be much bigger. King snakes will get about three and a half to four feet, maybe four and a half tops, mm. four and a half. So I wanted to make sure I built a bigger enclosure. Um, and someone is making the enclosure for me. And then I'm going to do the interior this time because I have an idea of what I want to do. That uh, little snake, which you didn't see down in the bottom, which is a Western haw the nose snake. Uh, um, I'm building out an enclosure that I have here. I got one online and you put it together yourself. Okay. And then I'm going to do the custom interior on that as well. Wow. And here's what the one I built. I'm building one for a friend. And here's what the interior looks like on this one. This is, this is quite cool. So very, it's a, it has a rocky thing. Now, it's yeah. not completed only because, you know, by the time you add the bottom, the substrate, plants, water bowl, the mm -hmm. light on top, the heat lamp, that kind of a thing. Yeah. But that's what I'm talking about uh, putting together. So I'm putting together something like that. Well, I hope you guys are enjoying this episode. Make sure to comment down to let me know about any feedback that you have. But I got to see that only 90% of you guys have subscribed to this channel on YouTube. So if you haven't subscribed already, subscribe right now because you don't want to miss the future episode of Behind the Voice where there's much more coming in from different voice actors. And if you don't know, I've already talked to around 60 actors from various video games such as Baldur's Gate 3, Alan Wake 2, Marvel Spider-Man 2, Last of Us, Resident Evil, and so many other video games. You can also become a channel member and you can get some perks such as watching an uncut, unedited version of every interview before everybody else. If you have any questions for the guest, your questions will get the highest priority at the same time. And you get to see early announcements of who's coming next to Behind the Voice podcast and many more. And now let's just jump back into this episode. Also, if anybody wants coaching, uh, there are times when people are like, will you coach? Do you coach? And I'm like, absolutely, absolutely. Because for me, coaching just is synonymous with sharing. Mm. Let's share. Let's find out where you are on your journey. And I think the reason I, I just accept and love coaching people is because it's not really coaching voiceover. It's coaching you to love yourself and find the most creative space within you to succeed. Yeah, that's beautiful. To succeed and choose success and choose self-love. So when I coach, I love doing it because it's more than do this and don't do this. Mm -hmm. It's more like allowing you to find your truest nature in what you do so that you can continue to do it for as long as you want to do it. Yeah. That's you know, good. That's it's great. loving you and nurturing you and then pushing you out the door. Yeah. So, and I do that uh, and I do it for free. Oh, wow. That's, that's so amazing. That's lovely. For free. Why? Because my thing is this, once I love you and nurture you and push you out the door, until you have an emergency, until you need to come back home, hmm. You have everything you need because you have you. Wow. <laughs> That's Look. wonderful. Yes, I love that. That is so cool. I think a lot of people um, ha don't have that per se. Um, and it, it's, it's important to hopefully uh, have th those people to have that in them. And I hope, I hope that, that they have the courage to take that step. But it's been so cool to see all those, yes. all the, all the things that you have and all the things that you're working on. It's, it, it so sounds as you have so much at the same time, and you're still able to yeah. handle all of it so well. And it shows at the same time because it doesn't hamper the craft, doesn't hamper all the characters that you get to play. And 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 it's incredible because one of the characters you played very recently came, Amanda Waller in Suicide Squad, killed the Justice League. Absolutely insane character. What a what a character to play. And I think you played it first in Batman, Telltale Games, uh, The Enemy Within, which was surprising yes. for me. Like, I didn't expect her to come along because I never expected Batman and then Amanda Waller to be also in the kind of the same screen, sharing the same screen and uh, uh, Gordon as well. So it was really cool to see all that. Well, she is a DC character. Yeah. And she's been around for a long time, but yes. I played four different projects. Yeah. Because after that, on HBO, or what is now called Max, mm -hmm. there's My Adventures with Superman. Yeah. 
that's an animated series on Max. And I play a different version and all of them are different. I have another project that I've signed an NDA for, so I can't talk about. Mm -hmm. But that's another version. Wow. So uh, with, with the Suicide Squad game, I really, but, yeah. again, I think Amanda Waller yeah. is one of those which I would be always intimidated by. I'll be like, I'm going to follow your orders, ma'am. Just, I'm going to follow it. it. It's just like that. You certainly will not have a choice. <laughs> exactly. You're not here for no reason, Robbie. Don't think I don't know anything about you. I know everything about you. In fact, I know more than your mother and your father. Do. Yeah. Surprise, surprise, surprise. I'm no seer, Junda, but I'll tell you this much. I will force you to do anything I want, and there's nothing you can do about it. So I am the force, and the force is with you always. Wow. <laughs> so amazing. It's lovely to see you work and all that. It's so, so cool. And, you know, you mentioned, like, how Amanda has been a part of DC for so long, and and so... It, I, I gotta ask: Is are you someone who is into like DC uh, comics or the characters of DC? Did you grow up reading comics? Did you get to watch any of those things, or what was it? Like, what did it for you? I'm older, so my 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 entrance into the world of DC started with a series called Batman. Oh, nice. um, and it starred Adam West, and so I'm a product of that period. So that was my entrance into it because all of the characters, uh, Burgess M Meredith playing the Penguin, yeah. uh, Frank Gorshin playing the Riddler, uh, uh, Cesar Romero playing the Joker. Mm. So for me, that was my entrance into it. Uh, and then when DC started making a hit with uh, making it into a, into a series of films, into a universe yeah. on screen, then it was like, oh, oh, oh yeah. <laughs> Let me see how they're moving this, you know, doing this now Uma Thurman as uh Poison Ivy uh Arnold Schwarzenegger as Mr. Freeze yes. let's see this and then all these different Batmans from Val Kilmer to Christian Bale to George Clooney uh just amazing and wonderful and 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 Rob Robert Pattinson it's yeah. just all of the different takes by all the different directors and the spaces that it held made this character interesting because of all the layers mm. that were similar, but all the nuances and essences that were different kept bringing me back into the theater. <laughs> the stories bring me back into the theater. And then watching the DC universe continue to grow, you know, with Aquaman and Gal Gadot as Wonder Woman. I just, wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's it's been amazing to see how DC has grown and it continues to do so uh, with James Gunn now being in charge and now he's creating his own sets of movies. I would love to see what he does with that. But yes, DC has been around for so long and animated shows has always been like the strong suit of DC and with the games that they uh, DC is also creating, it's been amazing. And and I remember in 2021 in the Game Awards, you came in uh, as Amanda Waller and you yeah. it was so cool because I was like, I, that's amazing. A, what, what do you remember at the time when you were on that stage being Amanda Waller and kind of showcasing in some ways like Suicide Squad, this game? Hating everyone. <laughs> that gave me the strength because yeah. I was really nervous because it was a live thing. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I thought I can come out and do my own thing. And they were like, no, there's a script. So it was like, oh my gosh. gosh. And I asked, can I change certain things? Because they weren't Amanda Waller. Mm -hmm. Because by that time, I had been voicing her and getting into that space for so long. And inside what we were recording for the game was different from what they were asking for here. It was not really Amanda Waller. It was me pretending to be Amanda Waller in order to advertise this, the Suicide Squad, Kill the Justice thing. So I was like the ad man for it, uh -huh. yeah. the ad woman for it. And I was like, so they gave me permission to change some stuff up. Not a lot, because I didn't want to disrespect anybody's work. Yeah. But they gave me permission to change some stuff up because it was literally 15 seconds, 20 seconds. So there wasn't much to change anyway. Mm -hmm. But I always wanted to make sure I had it down and had it down. And I was like, if you hate everybody and you just tell them off, you'll have it down. You know that's in you. So when I came out, it was just snarl. When they when they applauded, you know, it was, they couldn't tell if they should applaud or not. So the applause was kind of weak because all I did was this. 
<laughs> oh my god i don't think so anybody would applaud after looking at that so <laughs> yeah and had they applauded more i would have said shut up i don't need your applause <laughs> Because, you know, it was just all those little things. Yeah. And so for me, I wanted to focus on Debra, Debra, this is a short thing. And while it's still a promo, mm. you can still be Amanda Waller. And like she would say, get the job done, Task Force X. And that was my job. Get out there, hate, and get the job done. Mm. And, and so that's it. what I had in mind. And then the nerves went. After it was done, I was like, oh, good. I'm taking this off and go home. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I got stuff to do. I ride them, and I—I I don't know if I was on my motorcycle at the time because I ride a motorcycle. So it was take this off. Yeah, I think I was on my motorcycle. It was like take all this stuff, get on your bike, and let's go, let's do this. <laughs> um, so that's what I was thinking that time because I was so nervous. And I've done live stuff, and I'm always nervous. But when I get out there, all those nerves disappear because I—I I, um, you have to um transfer that. In other words, it's almost like when a baby cries because they're um, banging on pots and pans and you need the pots and pans to cook. And when you take it away, they're screaming their heads off. But you have to substitute it for something else. So you substitute it for a cookie and then they're fine again. And so that was me. That was me. It was like the substitute is my hate for you. <laughs> I'd rather hate you than to be nervous. I'd rather resent you than to be nervous. I'd rather make I'd rather look down on you than to be nervous. I'd rather take control with my, you know, with my look than be nervous. I'd rather be more aggressive than be nervous. And that's what I did. I substituted my my um, nervousness for aggression. And it works so well. <laughs> I gotta Thank say. you. It was, it was great to see. And and I, I have to say again, I think Amanda Waller is one of those characters that I just feel like there's such boldness. Like, I own you. And I love those. Like, I own you. Just remember that. And there's one more line I think I, I just love to see, which I didn't expect would be a line. It was like, I am you. Wait, wait, wait. Don't, don't say it. I'm going to I'm gonna say it in my head and see if it's the same thing. Okay. Was it, I'm not, was it addressed to Shark? I mean, I believe it was addressed to kind of everyone at the same time. <laughs> but it started out with Shark. Uh, yes. Yes, I believe so. Yes. I'm your daddy now. <laughs> exactly. I'm your daddy now. So good. I Was that it? Yeah, that was the one. <laughs> I did not expect that. I was like... Now, if if there was a line that I'm supposed to pick, which is my, that is the one. That is the one that I'll <laughs> pick as my favorite. I was like, you are right. <laughs> you are their daddy. <laughs> I love that. And, and yeah, and that is the definitive Amanda Waller in this game, in the Inception, because the Amanda Waller that has always been mm -hmm. was always a little heavy set. She wore a suit. She wore like a pink or light um, yeah. blazer with a, a, a skirt, like a skirt set. So she had on a pink blazer, a pink skirt. Um, she had uh, 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 pearls. Mm -hmm. She looked unassuming other than her size yeah. and her short afro. So Viola Davis was perfect to play her in terms of that look and that voice because Viola can sneak in and play anything. Mm -hmm. She is amazing at everything. She slips into a role and that's it. So I, I watched Suicide Squad the first time for the movie itself. Mm. But I watched it the second and third and fourth time just for Viola Davis's performance. Yeah. And how, and how un, very believably cold she was True. and casual about it. Yeah. See that sent shivers up my spine. I was like, you can't trust that person because they'll smile in your face and they'll, and you'll believe you'll believe you're in a safe space. You'll turn around and, and you'll be shot in the back of the head. And she won't think twice. Yeah. She'll wipe herself up and walk away. And I was like, that is way cold. That is way cold to not see it coming. And there was a scene in the movie where she kills everyone as as Colonel Flagg comes to get her. Yeah. And the whole Suicide Squad, their whole mission was to save her in this moment. And uh, and then she's like, and, and her only explanation, they didn't have clearance. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> She killed other human beings who had worked for her, gotten the job done, and she killed them all immediately and said they didn't have clearance. And that and I, that that always blew that part of the movie 
That scene always blew my mind, but I love Viola Davis. I started studying her to do her voice. I can do a great Viola Davis. Oh, wow. I can do a great. That's I, have been stud- I do a great Di- Viola Davis. And so, so that inception of her was very much the DC with the, the, mm. the, the blazer, the skirt, yeah. you know, she didn't wear. So for me wearing this, you know, turtleneck, this tight turtleneck and, um, and uh, 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 these slicks, these slacks, got my gun right under here, you know, with the short buzz cut, you know, the short little uh, shaved on the sides, mm. black lipstick, black nail polish. I'm like, that's bad ass, <laughs> bad ass. Okay, here's a little bit of my Viola Davis. The first time that I ever got a chance to play some of these characters, I knew, I knew that I could do this. I wanted to do it. I could do it. And all I had to do was get into that space. There are so many spaces that we all want to get into and that we have a right to get into creatively. And so for me, it was a powerful place that I wanted to hold on to. A powerful place where I could tell these types of stories. A powerful place that I knew I could be centered and grounded in my craft. That's why I am an EGOT winner. If you don't know what an EGOT is, it is an Emmy, a Grammy, an Oscar, and a Tony. (laughs) And I worked my butt off and I sweat and I cried and I bleeded the love of what I do to get where I am. I even was on a series where I snatched my wig off. And the producers didn't want me to do it. They did not want me to do it. But I said, I want that in this script. I need this in my script because here is a place where your audience, your audience is getting to see the real her in a way, in an intimate way that he had never seen before in the series. And I knew, I knew that I could do this and pull it off literally and figuratively. And I did. And that's why I am who I am because I love what I do. Oh my God. That's my Viola. That is so amazing. God. Wow. I adore her. Oh, I adore her. <laughs> That's so wonderful. Wow. I just love that. That was brilliant. Man, that loved it. It's so cool. And and I cannot believe that. And you, to be honest, you just played Amanda in this game so well. And there's been so many moments. I think it, uh, it's closer towards the end where uh, there's a scene where Superman and Diana, they're, they're fighting or one of them are fighting and then she's like, help me. You, you got to support, you got to take these orders, help me telling to the, the task X and just help me. Just, what are you guys doing? And she was like, at that time, kind of like helpless at that time. Like, you, what are you doing? You got to help me here. Um, what was that? Vulnerable. Very, very. Vulnerable. Yes. A side of vulnerability yeah. that, uh, and, and desperate. Vulnerability mm-hmm. and desperate. You know, and that's not her, but it, but in that situation, it was how do I take control, even though I have this vulnerable moment without them, I'd be dead. Mm. So I have to still be commanding enough so that I can get that help. But my commandingness is based on my vulnerability because I'm helpless. It was playing that fine line of, and I did think about that because I didn't want to just scream, help me and just say, help me and, yeah. and just... Because uh, no, you have to, as Amanda Waller, there still has to be that control. There still has to be that subversive. I'm ordering you to do this mm. because even the ordering is just a way of connecting to them of what she had been doing all along. Yeah. Which was, I order you task force X, task force X. And in this moment, it's like, I have to hold on to that because I need you. Mm. Because she would always threaten to blow their heads off. Yeah. I, but in this moment, I, I really need you. And so she didn't want to differentiate the two too much mm. because then it would show her vulnerability and it would show her vulnerable hand. And I did not want that. I did not want her to be weak because if she was going to die, she was going to die. Yeah. Or she would die trying to make sure that someone came. And if they didn't, she did what she had to do until the day she, until the moment she was murdered or destroyed. Mm-hmm. Or died. Yeah. But she was not going to be weak and helpless on the outside. On the inside, yes. On mm-hmm. the outside, never. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Like she, she did 
man, you just you just explained it so well, and 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 it it makes sense because that's how she is. She has to show outside that that she is not. She cannot show what what she's feeling inside because otherwise she's going to lose that what she's trying to still have uh, around these villains uh, obviously so it, it it showed and i really like that scene because i was like even though she's vulnerable she's still having that control which is i'm like oh that's amanda <laughs> i just like that absolutely and it all goes back to something that in when i started working with warner brothers to do this and rocksteady games the one thing that was going to be a platform for her that she would always 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 stand on she has no friends and yeah. she has no family. That's the major platform. She has no friends and she has no family, which gives her continual permission to do what she does, how she does it. She has no friends. There's no one to say, you know what, honey, why don't you think about, she has no one like parents or brothers and sisters that she's thinking about their lives and how they are. She has no friends and she has no family. So there's nothing that will change um, her morality what she sees, her morality, her integrity, her moral fiber, her moral fiber is to the job. Her moral fiber is to the world. Yeah. And it's, and her moral fiber is getting the job done at all costs and using whoever needs to be used. And I believe in another world, she do the same thing with Rick flag. <laughs> okay. If she had to mm. in a heartbeat, yeah. I really believe that in another world in another incarnation, she would she would even use Rick Flag. She used him in the movie. She did. Yeah. <laughs> she did. I think all of that is absolutely possible. Yeah. Hundred percent. Um, it's interesting because in Star Wars you did a more of uh mocap uh studio recording at the same time. Was that the pro was that somewhat the process here or was it all completely voiceover? Here's the deal. When I originally got hired and I booked it. I went over to the UK to do facial capture hmm. and only facial capture. Interesting. Then they brought me back over to do, I don't know if I did the body capture. I think I did the body capture as well. Then we did the, uh, the, the, the audition scene that I originally had when I first walked in to meet them all. Hmm. They did the body capture and the facial capture together. Okay. Then I realized the point of doing that was now that they had everything captured between the face and the body, they could then have all of the recordings that were approved and they could use somebody else's body because my body had already been rendered with CGI mm. and someone can get into the suit and then move. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So I did my voice. And then they took all of that and then they played it back. Obviously, once it was edited and put together the way they wanted and approved. So when someone was speaking, someone was doing the body. Mm -hmm. So when I was speaking, someone else was doing the body. And it was flawless. That wasn't my body. Wow. It was that flawless. wasn't my body. The same. Thank you. <laughs> the same way. And thank you. And thank you, Rocksteady Games, for believing in me. Thank you, Rocksteady Games. Thank you, Warner Brothers. Thank you, Warner Brothers. This is a um, a huge, prolific experience for me. And um, I am grateful for the opportunity. So I would be remiss if I didn't thank both Rocksteady in the UK and Warner Brothers. Um, that's the same way that uh, Steve Downs, who is the voice of um, Master Chief, yeah, he doesn't do any of the body work. It's done by an actor named Bruce Thomas. Bruce Thomas for years has been doing the body work of Master Chief while Steve Downs, who does not want to do performance capture, does the voice. Wow. Ask me what I'm drinking. What are you drinking? King Shark's blood. <laughs> I wonder if how, how that would be, how that would actually taste like. Tell you, hang on. Tastes like blood. Wow. Damn, I have nothing else to say on that. 
Well, if you guys love games and I love collecting artwork and posters, well, I sell those as well. I've made some posters for Alan Wake 2, Banisher's Ghost of New Eden, and I'll be making more in the future. You can check out my store at gamingmadness.com slash store to get to see what posters that you can buy. And you can even buy t-shirts for games such as Alan Wake 2. And now let's jump back into the episode. Is it hard for you or is it like, how, how, do you, how long do you, does it take for you to get into a character's mindset? Especially like Amanda and Seer. <laughs> Amanda and Seer are two different, very different characters. So how long does it take for you or, or your process to get into any of these characters that, that you get to play? Minutes. In? Minutes. Seconds, minutes. I'll tell you All why. Right. But a lot of people want to play them from the outside with their voice and what the words are and what the mm -hmm. dialogue is and what the scenes are. I don't play the scenes. I play the emotion because the one thing we all have in common, even if it is a written character, the one thing we all have in common as human beings is our emotions, our feelings. And so when I explore the words, I explore why, 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 why does she feel this way? Why, why, why? And when I tap into why somebody feels that way and I know that, I'm tapping into my feelings and my emotions, which is why I said I had an intimate relationship with Seer and everything became so symbiotic between Seer and Cal and Deborah and Muck Cameron. Mm -hmm. Because instead of just playing the words, I'm not playing the words. I never play the words, the feeling, the emotion behind it. And I don't care if it is, I don't care how big or small the role is and how many words we don't have, you know, or if it's just a one off of something, it's playing that space. And the why, why, why? Because once you know that, you're knowing the logic of yourself. You know why you put on headphones. You know why you wanted this podcast. You know why you woke up. You know why you want to eat and when you want to eat. So it, every choice is based on a why and answering that. Yeah. And so that's what it is. That's my foundation of everything is involve yourself, your emotions, because at the end of the day, no story that has ever been written will ever be greater than your own. Because no. you'll still be living it when it's done. Mm -hmm. And so it's your responsibility. It's my responsibility. Maybe not everybody else's, but it's my responsibility to immerse myself in that truth so much so that it breaks me. That's one of the things I did when I played Gryla mm -hmm. in, in um, God of War Ragnarok. That broke me that day. And it was beautiful. Because I was able to take up these big, beautiful pieces and put myself together, knowing that when I looked at what I did, it was good. I had one day to do this. One yeah. day. My Gryla scene was one day shoot. And I knew how important and special this was. I had never met any of the other actors before, and I refused to meet them. Because my granddaughter, Angerboda, was coming to see me after not seeing me for so long. So I never wanted to meet, and I apologize for not remembering her name, the young actress who played Angel Boda. And so I asked the director, can I please not meet her? Can I get my makeup done separately and everything else? And they're like, okay. And then right before we were about to shoot, I put my hand up and I walked over to her and I just looked at her in the eyes and then walked away. The first time she was startled because she didn't know what that meant. And I didn't tell her. And I never said a word. The second time I did it, she looked at me and she continued to connect. And she was like, my grandmother, this is my grandmother. Walked away. Third time I did it, she made me cry. Because the third time she got it and said, I feel so sorry for you, grandmother. Not, in, not, in, not with her mouth. Because the whole time I'm not saying anything. So she didn't either. Not with her mouth, but in her thoughts. She looked at me with such a sympathy and such a care that it broke me. And I started to cry and I had to walk away. And I had to get angry at that because I'm not, I don't want to show her emotion. I can't want to. And there, there was. Because the whole point of, of this grandmother in this one scene is I have to hide the emotions that will, that will break me. Yeah. And so I have to steal the memory of, of these animals to keep me safe and to keep me sane mm -hmm. and to help me survive because I can't think of my daughter and I can't think of my grandchild who looks like her mother. It will, it will, it will emotionally break me. I will not, I cannot, I will not suffer this. I will not suffer that loss by looking at you. Mm -hmm. And so that's why she was stealing the souls of these animals to help her relieve the memory 
release the memory and take on the memory of these animals instead. And so when she got me that last time, she looked at me and I saw the sympathy in her eyes and it began to, it broke me. And that's when I got angry because I said, like, God damn it. You're, 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 you're taking my, you're, my heart will not take this. And so that's when each time it did. That's when each time I was able to get into it with her. Each time I was able to get into it with her. And I never introduced myself. We never, even when the breaks to do the next, you know, to do that setup again or this mm -hmm. setup, I was always away from her. Then we went straight back into it again. And that last scene where she breaks the pot, I can't put it back together again, where she thinks she's saving me. Yeah. And I scream out, I should have pulled, I should have killed you the moment I pulled you out of your fucking mother. The last one that I did was filled with such love and such vitriol and such hate because it was the love for her. And it was the hatred of what she did. So I didn't hate her, not the way I saw it and not the way I felt it and not the way I brought that out. It was the hatred for what she did and a way of getting her away from me so she will never come back and do this again. And the love I have, which is fleeting as she leaves me. Yeah. Because this is it. It's that thing that this is it. I'll never see her again. And that, oof, it's breaking me now. To love someone so much that you have such vitriol and an experience to watch them go knowing you will never see them again. And you'll want to see them again somewhere in your lifetime and you never will. And you are the reason for that. That's, that's a lot for any human being to deal with. Mm -hmm. And so I went to that space. And when, when that was the last take, I was on my knees bawling. I could not get up. I just had to finally let it all go because I'd been holding it on to it for the whole, for the whole day. Wow. And then I, then I got out of it. Woo! You know, it's that kind of Nicolas Cage thing. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so I got into my Nicolas Cage space. Yeah. Woo. Because it was done and I, you know, and I went back to that space again. I got out of it. But um, I always hold that space um, as a sanctuary from the world. Mm -hmm. Not a sanctuary with the world. A sanctuary from the world because it is a, a sanctuary and an insane asylum at the same time within me. Yeah. And I leave it. But that's, I can get into it very easily because I really want to know how they feel. And now I have to use my feelings. Now I have to use my sorrow and my sadness and everything that I've been through. And Seer and I, I would say 99% of the stuff that was going on in her was going on and is going on with me. Still. Still. And so... I think she and I have an intimate relationship that um, that is lingering even more than the others. The others still linger in storytelling. Yeah. Spear lingers in activation, in actual ex continued experiences in my life and what I want to continue to do, which is, again, love and share and, and support people's creative space and support people's mental health mm -hmm. and support people's self-love and choices. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's so cool. Yeah. Your, your process is just incredible. And it just shows every single character, especially you mentioned like Bryla is like, oof, that her moments were so intense, I guess it, it's like, I feel like that's a weak word in some ways, but like, it's just, no, it's very powerful word. Yeah. It's very powerful because I know where it's coming from because it's not the word, it's your intention in mm -hmm. it. Yeah. And so I know your intention. So that, that is absolutely appropriate and 100% on the money. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's just like one of those memorable moments that I had in, in that game. And I think it's just where every game that you are a part of, you have you have various moments that just captures, at least for me, I don't know about every, everybody else, but it captures me, my attention immediately. And it's like, you just do that. And I'm in that zone. I'm, I feel like I am, I am also watching. Like I'm not in that, like I am not physically in that world, but mentally I'm there and I'm, I'm literally seeing you perform or that character say stuff to me and it's just like like i am it just it's just a hard feeling goal. yeah and that is my goal my goal is that you will stop listening to my voice and stop 
listening to my, watching my performance, but feel something about yourself in it. Like I am having those intimate moments with you because at the end of the day, you don't want to hear my voice. You want to feel your feelings. Yeah. And I always, when I coach and I teach, I say, you want to, you want to put, you want to do this business, put your voice last. Your, your voice doesn't make a difference. In the, in the very first moments of this, humble yourself. Humble yourself to the story. The story is always first. It came before you came. This story came before you came, before they even knew you were doing voiceover and before you auditioned and before you got called back and before you booked it. Yeah. So humble yourself to their craft. Why? Because they spent their emotions and their blood, sweat, and tears to make this happen. And chances are it didn't happen overnight. Yeah. It happened four years. There was rejection. There was this. There was that. There was a holdover. There was the pandemic. There was always something. And they had to feel what was going on in order to make this happen. Mm -hmm. Respect their feelings because they put it into their work. So when you get it, do no less than pour your feelings into it as well. Yeah, They're passing it to you like a relay race. They pass the baton. Mm -hmm. So when you take off running, you better be sure you're running to win this. And if you're going to win this, you can only do it by investing your emotions because no story will be greater than your own. So everything you felt in your own experiences, put it in there. Get vulnerable. Rip yourself up. And then put yourself back together again, stronger than you ever were, so that you can get on to the next thing you work on. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a... I guess that's a brilliant advice, really. Because I, I, I you just mentioned, like, everybody focuses as anybody who's like trying to get into voice acting, maybe in games and whatever else animation, um, they are more focused on voice and which is, which helps, but I don't think so. As you mentioned, it is not the most important thing. You have to be, you have to be that character. You have to be as if like you kind of forget you and you be that person that you're supposed that you're playing. So it's very important uh, so to be that. Absolutely. Someone once told me this isn't this is not called voice acting. It's called voice acting. Yeah. <laughs> and so you don't want to forget you. What you want to do is be able to allow them what I call for me. It's a possession. Mm. They can come in and out of me. And the reason they possess me is because they're using my body, my voice, my vocal cords, my diaphragm, my lips, my tongue. And they're using my emotions. So whatever they were feeling, I felt it in reality and I need to go back to that space. So I have to be present to go back to that space so that I am confessing my pain through their words. Mm. Yeah. It's a confession and a possession at the same time for me. Wow. I let them possess me so I can do anything because it's them that's doing it. And they're using my emotions to make me confess my truth through their words, no. confess the people that I've hurt in my life, confess my pain, confess my vulnerability, confess my joy, confess my desire to kill, confess my hatred, confess my love, confess my choice to love and help, confess my everything about who I am that belongs to them. And so, if you've been living your life, you have a library, a bank vault of experiences from childhood on yeah. that you can use to tell their story. But if you don't do it at all, your voice means nothing if you can't tell the story. Yes. Right. Yeah. That's, that's very well said. And it applies. It definitely applies. And I think anybody who's listening, and I know there's a lot of people I know uh, who want to be in this space, want to work in this industry. And I'm, I'm very sure that this will really help them to understand what they actually need to do and hopefully find success with that. And to be honest, I just want to say in the end, thank you so much for taking your time and really sharing so much in knowledge that I am feeling wiser than I was, I think like even five years ago. Um, but it's just amazing to always talk to you and, and to know everything. And it's so wonderful that like your passion comes through every single time. Even last year when I talked to you, your passion just, I just felt it. And it's just like in me. So today even is the same. So thank you for all that. Oh, thank you very much. It is so my pleasure. And thank you for your time.
as well. I know it's after midnight. I know it's like one o'clock in the morning or the left at one o'clock in the morning. I mean, it's close to it. It's close to it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So thank you for your time and um, and getting up so early in the morning to to spend your time with me. So thank you. Absolutely. It is my absolute pleasure. And, and you know, I'm so excited to see what's coming next. I know you have, you have so much, um, a, a lot of different projects to work on. I'm very much, and since I'm, a, I'm a, someone who plays games a lot, I'm so much excited for your next project in a game. And because I know that a lot of people who keep on coming back to Sabathon all the time. Um, and I've seen some people like, oh, she has played Sabathon. I'm like, yes. <laughs> and people always have those comments every time. Well, for those that know me, Guardian. Oh, Guardian's mine. There you are. Listening in on this conversation, yes? Good. Because trust me, Guardians, there's a lot more to come. And you won't be ready. 